Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this episode of 30 Minutes to President's Club. My name is Armand Farouk, and I'm here with my co-host, Nick Sigelski. And today, it is a three, four, five, seven, ten-time guest of 30 MPC. I don't even know anymore, but every single time Kyle Coleman jumps onto the 30 MPC mic, it is a Hall of Fame episode, and today is no exception. He is the CMO over at Copy AI, previously was running all of SDR and marketing over at Clary. Nick, why should people listen? This was not a sales 101 episode. We weren't talking about the basics of good subject lines or how to ask a discovery question. Kyle got really, really specific around outbound prospecting to above the line executives. This is not about how to prospect to a manager or a director. This is how to prospect to an executive. And he talks through how to look for pattern matching of your current customers not necessarily of what industry or type or persona, but of initiatives that they had that made them buy your product, how to pattern match, where to find those patterns in your territory for the prospects you're going to be outbounding, and then how you weave that into your messaging. And then also, this was the very first episode where somebody talked about AI, and I was like, oh, wow, that's actually something that would be valuable to a sales team. And so if you want to learn a real 30 mpc affide use case for AI and sales, listen to this episode. All right, Kyle, welcome to the show. We start every single episode with your top three actionable takeaways. So let's get your three. Number one, you have to really understand why your customers have purchased your solution. And more importantly, why have executives chosen to fund this service or this solution that you sell? Mm -hmm. Most sellers do not pay nearly enough attention to this. They think, oh, companies buy us because we have this feature, we have this capability. And of course, every company needs this feature or this capability. I got news for you. That ain't it. Companies buy for strategic reasons. Companies buy in order to fulfill strategic initiatives. And one of the best examples I have of this, guys, was during my time at Clary. Clary is a revenue intelligence and forecasting type solution. And we found that we were selling to a lot of cybersecurity companies. And I was like, what is going on here? And I spent probably a month like talking to customers, talking to the customer success team, talking to our execs, being like, what is the secret sauce? Do we have some feature that cyber companies love or what is going on here? And my search was totally fruitless. Like I never came up with anything. But what I did find out was that back in 2021, these cybersecurity companies were hot companies to go public. Cybersecurity is pretty recession-proof. Investors love it. And these companies needed to have predictable revenue, predictable forecasting in order to show public investors that they were investable, they were trustworthy. They needed Clary to help with that forecasting precision. And that was a real aha moment for me because then it wasn't just about us selling and marketing to cybersecurity companies. It was about us selling and marketing to any company that's on the same path to IPO. And that was a light bulb moment and really helped our sales and marketing team find and target those companies and have a lot of success. Great. What's number two? Number two, how do you actually find these strategic initiatives? So it's one thing for me to say, yeah, go and sell to executives and, and they're going to fund this project. Finding these initiatives is a little trickier. This is where super deep account research, super deep contact research is extremely important. So as you're researching your accounts, I think the mistake that a lot of people make, and you guys have seen this before, people either entirely skip account research or they do it like a hand-waving box-checking exercise. Yeah, I know where they're headquartered and I know how many employees they have. Like, that, that ain't it. You need to really go through job postings and see what is this company hiring for? Let's use this Clary example again, where maybe if a company now is hiring for the first time a CFO or a controller, or somebody they didn't have before that's, oh, they're getting more mature in the finance operation here. How does that jibe with the growth that they've had over the last few quarters? Because a lot of that information is publicly available, either on LinkedIn or um, somewhere else. And now I can start to put two and two together and say, oh, this company is on a path to IPO. This company is a good fit for me. So this type of intent for this type of strategic initiative is extremely valuable. It just takes some elbow grease for you to go and track down, to go and find. But it's that type of account research. It's that double click that really leads to valuable uh, outreach. Very nice. Round us out. What's number three? Number three, you have identified the patterns. You've found the accounts that are fits for this. Now, tip number three, you have to adjust your messaging for these strategic initiatives. It is not good enough in this case, if I identify this company that's on a path to IPO, it's not good enough for me just to say, hey, we're going to help your sellers forecast better. 
What we have to say is we're going to help your sellers forecast better so that you're going to have more predictable revenue in quarter and out quarter and public investors are going to have more confidence in your ability to deliver on a revenue plan. That's what the standard is that Wall Street has for public companies. Care to learn more? And that type of messaging that's more specific and more strategic, that's what's going to get the attention of the executives that you need to fund this project. It can't just be a copy-paste exercise of the value props that you have on your website that are more general. You have to recast them, re-swizzle them for the research that you've done on that account, and that is how you're going to break through the noise. All righty, Kyle. Let's start with how I should even know what initiatives to look for. Mm -hmm. So if I'm like, okay, I need to figure out the initiatives as to... What was supporting the purchase of Clary or what was supporting the purchase of copy AI? If I'm an SDR, where do I actually figure that out? You have to go on this internal quest across your company to go and speak to the customer success people or the people that are running executive business reviews or whatever it may be. And just ask this question, which is why do buyers buy our solution? And the initial answer that you're going to get is going to be probably somewhat surface level. Oh, they bought us to improve forecasting. So, okay. But why? In pursuit of what? To solve what problem? What is the impact of solving that problem? You just have to be curious about it, Armand. You just have to go across your business and meet with people that you maybe don't have a ton of face time with otherwise. Talk to the implementation team. Talk to the customer success team. Talk to the executives that run either of those organizations and really ask those questions. Or here's a crazy idea. Talk to customers. What a concept. Ask them these questions directly. You'd be surprised with the variety of answers that you're going to get and how that's going to inform the way that you do your outreach at the top of the funnel. So one of the things that you mentioned early is, okay, we have to tie to one of these strategic initiatives. Could you give some examples of good strategic initiatives that we could look for? for any product, and then maybe bad strategic initiatives where it's, wait, no, that's actually not a strategic initiative, that's false signal. I, I want to be clear here that we're talking about messaging that's going to resonate higher up inside the organization. Mm -hmm. And the reason I want to emphasize this is because the manager level, the individual contributor level people, they're not thinking about quarters in the future, years in the future. They're thinking about how to do their jobs today. They have more tactical problems, and you can use messaging that's a bit more tactical, feature-focused for them. We refer to those prospects as, you know, below the line prospects, super important use case champions. You, you need to love them, but they're probably not going to be the ones that fund the project or make a decision in order to influence the people that do. This is where you need to attach to those longer term initiatives. So how do you find these initiatives or what are some other examples? We mentioned the path to IPO is obvious. Expand international expansion. Hey, we have a sales team. We're growing in North America. Now we're opening our first office in London and we're going to go after the EMEA market in Western Europe. That is a strategic initiative. That is a company making a big bet that they're going to have success in Europe. So what can you do to help with that expansion? If you are a sales enablement type company, you can talk about onboarding. You can talk about making sure that the processes in North America lend themselves nicely to Europe. If you're a localization company, you can talk about how you can make sure that all of the content that they have, all the sales outreach collateral they have is now going to be localized into all of the languages that make up the European continent. Whatever it is that you sell, you can find the right way to connect the dots between that strategic initiative and your value prop. You just have to put that extra time and energy into it. Some other ones are companies that undergo a merger and acquisition. They have a whole new company, basically, that they need to subsume and then bring into the fold. How can your solution help them on that quest? So most of the time, the best strategic initiatives are ones that are very close to revenue because that is how you're going to make a business case. That's what executives, especially CFOs, who are more often than not guys in this, they're signing off on these deals. The closer you are to revenue, the better and more believable your business case is going to be, yeah. and the higher likelihood that the CFO is going to sign off and say, okay, I understand how this company is going to impact me. I'll give you an example of a bad strategic initiative, Nick, which is something that's a little bit looser and not super specific. So you are expanding internationally. We can help with sales rep productivity. You're forcing the CFO to do a lot of thinking and a lot of dot connection herself mm -hmm. to say, how will this sales productivity help with this international expansion? I don't totally connect the dots there. So you need to be specific. You need to hopefully as best you can be as close to revenue as possible. And that's how you're going to have a, a really high velocity motion here. I'm thinking about if I wanted to put this into practice as an SDR or an AE who's prospecting, let's say I have a book of 
200 accounts. I've talked to a bunch of customers and I'm like, okay, I've got my three initiatives. We're really good with people who are close to IPO to get them sharpened in forecasting. We're really good with folks who are opening a new office. We're really good with folks who've gone through recent mergers and acquisitions. One thing I might struggle with is of my 200 accounts, there might be like four that are close to IPO, maybe three open up in a national office, and then maybe two are involved in M&A. And then I've got the remaining like 180 other accounts in my book. Do I need to do customer interviews for every single one of these customers to figure out how they're going to buy? How do you actually take these initiatives and overlay them into your territory? This is why outbound is so hard is because it's rare for you to find companies that are in market for your solution. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. So if you do find those four companies out of your 100 or 200 that are in market, Mm -hmm. full court press on those four. You need to to go super deep on the research. You need to be hyper custom with every sales touch point. You need to get your executives involved and doing outreach to the executives at those companies. You need to work with the marketing team and make sure that you have the custom ABM approach, the landing pages, the digital ads, all of the resources that you possibly can for that subset of your customer base. And hopefully you can make the right case to all these cross-functional stakeholders that the juice is worth the squeeze here. You can say to them, the reason I'm focusing on these four is because they have the right pattern match of strategic initiative that these other 50 customers of ours have had. So now we can go execute this go-to-market strategy for these four accounts. Now for the other ones that don't have a fit here, focus on the below the line personas. Go with the more feature capability oriented messaging. Just try and get some meetings with them so that you can talk to them and learn more about what their strategic initiatives are. Because sometimes this information just isn't publicly available, but very often it's privately available. It's secret information that you're gonna get by doing a bottoms up type approach. Spend maybe 80% of your time and energy on the accounts that you know are in market or are showing this quote unquote intent of strategic initiative, and then focus the other 20% of your time on the more run rate, generalized, templated, below the line outreach. Yeah, when I was at PAVE, one thing that was really helpful, if we could catch a company who was just going public or announce that they were going public, the confusion around equity and stock options converting from private to public was massive. And they were also really worried about retention issues because everyone's getting this big payday and then they're going to leave. So to me, that was maybe 5% of the companies in my book, but I would always start with that. Yes. Mm -hmm. But then if I went to my second initiative, there might be some other initiative that's a little bit more common. Maybe that's 10% of my book. And then the third initiative is 20%. And the fourth initiative is 50%. So ideally you have three, four or five initiatives where you can say, all right, I can run through this stack rank of initiatives. And chances are, if I go through all five, I'm really lucky if the first one hits, but at least the fifth one is broadly applicable enough that I can use some sort of above the line messaging. That's a really good way of framing it, that kind of tiered approach. One thing I want to add on to this for sales reps and even for leaders here is part of the reason executives in particular get frustrated with speaking to lower level people, entry level people that have less experience perhaps at the company is because those SDRs, those AEs, they don't really understand this strategic initiative that we're selling against. So the advice or the mandate, I should say, to SDRs and AEs here is if you're selling against this strategic initiative, like Armand just mentioned, you have to really know what you're talking about. Dive into the research, read some things about this, listen to podcasts about leaders that have gone through this transition before, become a student of this so that you're credible, so that you can have a real conversation with people around this topic. Otherwise, it's not going to land super well. It's going to seem like messaging that you've just regurgitated because you probably have. So you really need to understand it. And I think this is something that the top 1% of sales reps do and the other 99% don't. And that's the difference between P-Club and not is like becoming a real student, not just of your own business, but of the businesses that you're selling to as well. There's a million different places that I could do research and I don't have endless time to research all 200 accounts in my patch. Where are the places that you consistently find the best intel on the accounts that you're looking to sell to? I don't necessarily care that somebody somewhere is searching for a keyword of AI for content marketing. That's not a trigger for me that says, oh, I need to go sell to this account. It's Mm -hmm. not really important enough. But an intense signal I do care about, Nick, is are they hiring a senior level go-to-market leader, sales, marketing, customer success, operations, who has AI in the job description? If they are... What does that mean to me? That means to me that the executive team 
has decided to fund a role, 200K, 300K, whatever it is, fund a role where this is a key part of the job description, they're in the market for my solution at Copy AI. Mm -hmm. I can go get in front of this account with a lot of confidence that my messaging is going to land around, hey, here's how we can help you implement a go-to-market AI strategy. That's the type of thing in job descriptions that I think is extremely important. Now, the problem you might say is I have a hundred accounts in my territory. I can't read every open job description that they have every day. No, you cannot, but guess who can. And I know y'all are going to have some messaging on this pretty soon about how to leverage AI for account research. You can use something like ChatGPT, like whatever, just you should use it to synthesize all this information. That's really hard for a human to do. And then draw out the insights that take humans a long time to draw out. And AI is uniquely suited to do this for job posting. So that's one really great example. We have what we call a workflow. And what a workflow is, is it's just a codification of a complex process. So in this case, the process is go to their job listing page, open up the link, read the link, look for the keywords. And we have that codified as a process. So now you can feed any URL you want into that workflow. And you've already trained the workflow on what keywords to look for. And just in a snap, it'll go do all of that keyword surfacing for you or not. It'll say, nope, no companies are hiring for anything like this. Move on to the next one. So that's the copy AI world, which is more workflow automation for other types. Like if you have ChatGPT or if you have Claude or something like that, it's going to be a little bit more manual where you'll probably need to either paste in the link to the job description one at a time mm -hmm. and have it scrape, read and surface the keyword. Or maybe you might need to copy paste the actual content of the job posting. You yeah. can do some version of this with ChatGPT. It's just not going to be as fully automated as something like Copy AI would be. Mark Cosaglo, my other co-host, wrote a newsletter on how to do some of this stuff inside of ChatGPT, a free chatbot. Nice. And his process actually looks really similar to yours, Kyle, which is first thing is like understand the industry level insight, the big business initiatives. And so the types of things that he wants to understand for the product he's selling is show me product lines that are declining in revenue. Then from there, what he does is he exports, for example, Dick's Sporting Goods, 10K, and then plugs that into ChatGPT. So when you plug that in ChatGPT, then you can then ask, okay, which of their product lines had the biggest decline in sales? And instead of having to scour an entire 10K, ChatGPT will actually tell you which one it is. Right. And then from there, you can start to ask it questions around, is this a Dick Sporting Goods issue or is this an industry-wide issue? And that's where you can start to get smart about that type of thing. And then the final step is you can be like, okay, if you were selling a marketing agency and sold these seven services, what are the different ways you could support some of the initiatives that are inside of Dick Sporting Goods 10K? And so you can go pretty far with this stuff in a way that oftentimes I hear people just using AI to write really bad emails. Yeah. and there's so much more that you can do with it to come up with insight without manually scouring every single interview yourself. Some other sources would be a company's press releases, treasure trove of initiatives and what matters to the company there. New product launches. What are they taking to market and why? That tells you a lot about what they're targeting, segments, industries they're targeting, new personas they're targeting. Hey, you have a new product. How can we help your cross sell? into your customer base. So that could be another strategic initiative that you attach to there. We talked about interviews across the entire executive team, CTO, CEO, CFO, like whoever's putting themselves out there. What are these people saying on social? More and more executives are getting more and more active. So all of these things are sources. The virtue of having the workflow builder is you can define all of these things once in a single workflow. Read all the job postings, look for, the, look for these keywords. Read the 10K and the earnings calls and look for this stuff. Scour the web for relevant company news and look for this understand industry trends and what's popping in the industry, research their sales cycle and tell me what their ACV is and what their customers are. You can define all of these things in a single workflow and then run it once for all 200 of your accounts. And you get all of this information that's just right at your fingertips for you to go and execute on. There's a spectrum of automation. You can go the really streamlined approach with tools like Copy AI if you want, or you can go the a bit more manual. It's going to take a little bit more juice, but the juice is worth the squeeze in the chat GPT example. Either way, you have to do it. You can't do this manually. AI is very good at this. So please, 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 in some form or fashion, use AI and leaders, make sure that you have this injection or this infusion of AI across these various processes because synthesizing information and drawing out insights is extremely labor intensive and expensive. AI is very good at it. You just need to put it to work. I've seen some really poor above the line messaging <laughs> that talks all about the business priorities and other cybersecurity companies are using Clary to support those initiatives. 
And that's about as much as you get in terms of how you actually help them solve for those business problems. Right. How do you weave the initiative into the solution in one clean pulled email? Let's actually understand or do some brainstorming about how we can attach our value prop to these strategic initiatives. And this is another thing you can use AI for is you can input, here's the strategic initiative companies that are pre-IPO on a path to IPO, and here is our value prop. And you wanna paste in a long value prop for all the products you have, the services you offer, whatever it may be. Hopefully that exists at your company. If not, you can write it yourself. And then you can ask the AI, connect the dots between the two. How can my value prop be rewritten in support of this strategic initiative? And you can get a little brainstorm and the AI will come back with three, five, six, whatever different angles, sales marketing angles that you can then use for that account. Okay, great. Now I have my sales angles. I have some verbiage. I have this dot connection between initiative and my value prop. And now I need to go and actually turn it into an email. So this is where a lot of people talk about, certainly me, cold email best practices and keep it short and, and all these things. And that definitely still applies, but that ignores relevancy and that ignores resonance. And if you've done a lot of research and you know that you're reaching out to a senior level finance person who's probably going to be responsible or at least very involved in this pre-IPO process, and you hit the nail on the head with your messaging and the resonance of that messaging, you can get away with a bit more context in your email, which is to say a bit more length in the email. Now that said, it still needs to be crisp. It still needs to be readable. You don't want to write a novel to them, but you can probably get away with being a little bit more robust than that. I probably would hesitate to go much longer than 150 or 200 words in any cold outreach, but explain yourself. I was researching your company. I see you're on a path to IPO. I read this interview with your CEO. We've helped other companies on the same path in this specific way. And here are the other companies that we've helped. Would love to understand a bit more about where you are in the journey. And if we can help it, let's find some time to connect next week. Like that type of thing. And I know that's super general and that sounds pretty similar to a lot of the email formats we've already had. The main takeaway here though, guys, is don't worry about length as much. It doesn't need to follow this silly rule around, it should be a text message. No, you're communicating a lot of value here. The more valuable your message is, the more you can get away with it being slightly longer. To the point of making your message more valuable and focusing on resonance, my question for you is how many sources of information or observations about the prospect are you including in an, a cold email? It sounds like you might be weaving in multiple things, but I might be wrong. And so I'm curious about your recommendations for what sounds like more enterprise-esque prospecting. Yeah, I would say, Nick, I'm more aligned with you, like one objective or one sort of call to action here in the email. But what I would say is maybe you're doing a little bit more inference to arrive at mm. this point, when I'm reaching out to somebody, it's not necessarily the fact that they hired or are hiring a controller. The objective I want to point out is that they're on a path to IPO. Yeah. So I can weave those two things together and say, hey, you just hired the most senior level finance person you've ever had. Yeah. Combined with the fact that I saw your company's growing at a pretty insane clip, I have to imagine you're on a path to IPO. And then the rest of your email is about how you help on that path to IPO. It's interesting because you guys were talking about industry trends earlier. And for a long time, I thought people just threw that out there for whatever reason. Oh yeah, you got to know industry trends of what's going on with insurance defense law firms. But actually hearing about how you practically apply that, that's actually almost another point of personalization that you can apply to a significant portion of your patch. Because now what you're doing is you're juxtaposing observation against trend. And it feels really, really personalized, even though that trend can be applied pretty blanket to all of the companies that fit a specific type. I actually had not thought about that until just now. So it's exactly right. It's very well said. And then the other thing about knowing the industry is that's credibility. If you're selling into executives at telecommunications companies and you don't mm -hmm. understand what's going on in the industries, the tailwinds they may have or the macro challenges they may be facing, you're not going to show up as credible. Your point of view on their account is incomplete. And maybe that won't burn you in the first call. It will burn you eventually. So you really do have to have that business acumen. You have to have that comprehensiveness in how you're approaching these accounts and knowing what's happening in the industry is a really critical part of that. To go back to the example of the one with Dick's Sporting Goods, one of the things that Mark did in the message is he's like, all right, so we have the company observation, which is this product is going down in revenue. But then you ask AI, is this an industry trend or a Dick's trend? And then from there, you can now say, okay, you're actually doing pretty well relative yeah. to the industry, or you're not doing well. In this case, 
they weren't doing very well and the industry wasn't doing well. And then the insight that you can deliver is there's another company like REI mm -hmm. that's also in the industry that is seeing a big decline in fitness and outdoor activities. And they were actually up 7% because we were able to help them with all of their new brand campaigns, targeting the right people in the right areas and things like that. And so you go company ob observation, big initiative, industry-wide insight that shows you're not a complete rando, how you support them being in the upper quartile of the industry and then a call to action. And it doesn't have to be that rigid thing. That is shockingly not a three paragraph email, which is what I used to live and die by, but it feels like a longer form of email is becoming more socially acceptable. And frankly, it might even come off as more human nowadays. It's, as long as it's valuable. I use the word resonance already. I think about context at scale. How can you provide context? This is like the old John Barrow saying, why, why me, why now? And we got so far away from that for whatever reasons, the better and more informed your context is and the better you can communicate that context and why they should care. That's the attachment to your value prop. The more you're going to be able to get away with the longer, more value add value oriented type of email. Now, again, there are theoretical limits here and you don't want to send, I don't care how good an email it is. If it's 45 pages, I'm not going to read it. You got to keep it somewhat tight. But you can definitely get away with bucking some of the quote unquote best practices that you've probably seen or heard evangelized on LinkedIn. So I've got one last offshoot question here, which is we're writing this beautiful human email and it's not three paragraphs. Maybe it's four, maybe it's five. We're delivering industry insight. And usually what happens is email number one is really personalized. Emails two through 17 are extremely templated. I'm wondering if your approach has changed on that front, or if you still keep the rest of your sequence pretty templated? I've never advocated keeping the sequence templated. If you come up with this strategic initiative and you connect the dots to your value prop, there are five, six, 10 different ways that you can write that email and mm -hmm. accomplish the same thing. Hit the same hammer, the same strategic initiative over and over and over again. Maybe you're talking about a portion of your product in the first email and a different portion of your product in the next email, both of which should help realize this strategic initiative in some way. Keep on that theme for the entirety of the sequence. This is now, again, I want to emphasize, this is for above the line messaging to executive level decision makers inside of these accounts. You have to tell a story that's going to matter to them. And that story is going to be around the strategic initiative. So you've got to stay on theme for the whole sequence. I'll use copy AI as an example. So copy AI, we have this ability for go-to-market workflow automation. We can create and codify any go-to-market team's best practices across sales, marketing, SDR, whatever it is using AI. We've identified that this company is expanding internationally. Email number one, we could talk about sales, how we're going to help them bring on and make their sales team more effective because we're going to help them with this account research. They're going to hit the ground running. Take your new seller ramp time from six months down to two months, and they're going to be that much more productive. But you're going to hit your revenue targets with this international expansion much more readily than you would have otherwise. Email number two. We can help with the localization of your content. So you have all this great content that's been working for your US team from a marketing standpoint. Let's rewrite it in French and German and Spanish and all the other languages that we need to write it in so that your sales team and your go-to-market team is as effective as possible in this new market that you're in. There are definitely ways that you could think about your value props and recast them to sell against the same strategic initiative a handful of different ways. You just have to be a little bit more creative. And again, AI can help with that brainstorming and that creativity. All right, Kyle, the clock is ticking. We are running out of time. We got to move to the final question. We've talked about a lot of really great things salespeople should be doing. Now we got to flip it on its head and ask about a shouldn't. What is one bad habit that you see a lot of salespeople exhibiting that you think they need to break because it hurts them more than it helps? They're using AI the wrong ways. Some sales reps are just going into ChatGPT and they're like, write me an email that sells this product to this persona. And that email sucks because they're not putting in the time and energy and effort that it takes to write a really good prompt. If you're just going to half-ass the use of any technology or really of anything, it's probably not going to yield the fruit that you think it is. So put in the time, put in the energy to learn the technologies that you're using. If that's ChatGPT, learn how to prompt. Listen to that interview with Mark Casaglo. Like, be a student of this. That's how you're going to get real value. If it's something like Copy AI, put in the effort to create a workflow that is an actual representation of your unique and nuanced process. If you don't do that, you're going to be continuously disappointed with AI. You're going to think it's a silver bullet. It isn't. And you're going to get bad results that end up actually probably doing more harm than good. Kyle, thank you for joining us. Phenomenal episode. Everybody, stick around for a 60 second recap. Coming up soon. 
All righty, Nick, it is time for a two by two recap from this episode with Kyle Coleman. What do you have for your two? So my first one is look for strategic initiatives, which you can also think about as what are the big bets that a company is making? Those might be things like an IPO, international expansion, a merger and acquisition. You want to look for things that are close to revenue. Those will typically resonate with executives more strongly. Number two was if you want to double personalize your outbound messages, juxtapose your observations about a company with industry trends for the person that you are prospecting into. When you combine those two and layer them together in outbound messaging, it seems double personalized to your prospect and thus resonates more powerfully. Number three, I would go and build a table after this. And I would write down on the left-hand side of your table, what are the key initiatives that led a prospect to buy? And then on the right-hand side, I would write down, where can I find that information? A 10K, a CEO interview, a news article, et cetera. And then lastly, number four, once you figure out where you can find that information, export those pages, print them to PDF, find a way to plug them into ChatGPT or Copy AI or any of these natural language processors and use that to expedite your research process when you know where to look for these initiatives. All righty, Nick. How can people help us out here? Armand, you referenced in this episode, but we put together a step-by-step -step breakdown of how you can actually use AI to do this. There's a link in the show notes to so go get it. Check it out, and we'll see you next week on the show. Oh.